Hello and welcome back to Wine Reform. We're just gonna launch right into it because why not? Uh, wine. Wine has a couple definitions. Uh, wine can be described as well, the fermented juice of grapes uh, used as an alcoholic beverage, or I have heard a few people, especially home winemakers, describe wine as the fermented juice of any plant, usually a fruit, um, that can be made into an alcoholic beverage. A lot of wine purists probably don't think of it this way, but for fruit wines, those exist. There's peach wine, elderberry wine, blackberry wine, black currant wine, cherry wine, pineapple wine. Honestly, there are so many different wines. If if you can juice it and you can ferment it, you can probably make it into wine. But as I noticed, um, fruit wines tend to be produced where Vitis vinifera, our classic grape wines, don't really do very well. Um, those tend to be outside of the 30 degree and 49 degree latitude range on both the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. So that's why if you go further north you might see more elderberry wine or maybe lingonberry wine or just any fruit wine depending on where you are. So what we think of as wine grapes, that Vitis vinifera, uh, it tends to do very well in a specific kind of environment and this does vary a bit from variety to variety but in general that tends to be um, drier well-draining soil, uh, good air circulation, uh, water but not too much water, and uh, uh, good sunshine half the day and then some good coolness in the other half to really encourage that development of flavors. So perhaps for this reason we don't really see a lot of blending of Vitis vinifera and other fruit. Because after all, what grows together goes together. I mean, that's a very common uh, saying in the farm to table movement, if you are familiar with that style of cooking. If you are, pretty cool. Definitely appreciate that. So because of this what grows together gro goes together mentality, it is most likely that the antithesis is true, except for now. Also another reason we might not see a lot of blending of that Vitis vinifera and fruit wine is probably because of wine purists, um, which I don't fault them. They like what they like and that's awesome, but I do have a very strong feeling that a wine purist would scoff at this idea. However, winemakers are getting adventurous. Uh, we've seen a lot of really fascinating alternative uh, sort of styles of wine or alternative ways of using wine, and we have barely scratched the surface. So. We're gonna circle back to this. So the craft beer movement. It has been going in the US since 1978 when home brewing became legal. Um, now, if you aren't familiar with craft beer or craft brew, um, at least in the United States, it is generally, everyone has that one friend who is a huge fan of IPAs or really strange sours, you know, the hipster friend. And if you don't have a friend like that, then it's most likely that you are that friend. I just had to say it, it had to be said. So, <laughs> craft brew in the US has really, um, it's been up and coming since the 1980s with Sam Adams and onwards, although we know Sam Adams isn't quite craft anymore. Anywho, but craft brew really saw spark in uh, 2008 to 2016. And I have noticed that it has not slowed down. It is still going. I mean, craft brew, it really encourages um, experimentation and um, trying new things and um, smaller batches. It provides more work. It's really awesome. Um, and of course, it encourages these fun, wild new flavors. So if you appreciate drinking something uh, totally different, craft brew might be a fun thing to try. Now I could keep going on craft brew because I, um, there's a lot of it around me. I love it. Um, I appreciate finding, new, finding a new brewery or a new brewer and trying out their stuff because most of the time I learn something new, we get talking and there's a fascinating um, method that they're trying that I've never heard of before, but I digress <laughs> um, beyond that. The craft brew movement has a very long storied and fascinating history. And it really does explain the ebb and flow of small production to large scale production back to small again. Um, unsurprisingly, it has a lot to do with prohibition and the like, um, shocker. So if you'd like to know a little bit more about that movement, I've put a timeline down in the description for you to check out. But back to wine. Um, there's craft beer, so what about craft wine? Could that be a thing? 
Q Lefty Wine Company. Uh, they created three wines, uh, each made with a double fermentation method, basically adding in a bit of fruit juice for that second fermentation. Um, this means that they make Vitis vinifera wine, they let that ferment, and then they add in their fruit juice and let that ferment again. The concept of a double ferment is actually, it's not new, it's very common in craft brew. However, bringing that to commercial wine is kind of a new concept. Lefty wine, they really do they really do market themselves as craft wine. Um, just last year, they partnered with Dust Bowl Brewing Company um, in order to put on an event which combined craft beer and craft wine, bringing together people who appreciate both and maybe opening their eyes to the other. Because after all, wine does not live in a vacuum. Something I should mention though, um, a lot of uh, craft brew, uh, especially the smaller it is, the smaller the operation. That means that generally they're not always going to be part of a big company. Uh, but kind of like Sam Adams started small and then became large with Boston Brewing Company, uh, Lefty Wine is part of Ian J. Gallo. So it is not independent. It is um, pretty commercially owned. Thought I should mention that. Um, capitalism, I guess. So anywho, today we're going to be trying Lefty's th three wines. I can count. We're going to be trying their Maiden Voyage White Blend, their Final Frontier Rosé Blend, their Flight of Fancy Red Blend. And just in case y'all don't know me by now, I did go to a liquor store around the corner for myself and I got each bottle for $10.99 before tax. So as I mentioned, there are three wines to try. We are gonna be going from the lightest to the darkest wines and we're gonna try them all um, in tandem. So not one and then the other and then the other. We're gonna do each step, but just go one by one. So why don't we get started? Okay, so now that we have our three wines open, we're just gonna zip on through our evaluation, uh, starting with the appearance. So when I opened it, there was a slight bit of effervescence. I will say that. Nothing floating in the wine, just a bit of carbonation, which makes sense because they did a double fermentation. Um, the color for this white blend is very pale, pale straw yellow. Um, Honestly, really pretty. So that's our white blend. Now for the rosé. Um, again, slight bit of effervescence makes sense, double fermentation. Um, this one has a very faint peachy color. The intensity is very light and once again there is nothing floating in that wine. So it looks great. Alrighty. The last one to evaluate is our red blend. Um, so let's take a look. Uh, no effervescence in this one. This one is very still. There is a medium intensity, and I'd say it has much more of a garnet color. There's definitely a little bit of brown in that red. It's kind of deep, almost blood red, so very pretty. Alrighty, so appearance aside, now we get to sniff them. Um, and after we have sniffed them and tasted them, I will tell you guys what the fruit juice um, was for each of these wines that was in the second ferment. So let's start with that white wine. Okay, so for the white wine, the nose is intense. It is very strong and I am getting notes of a lot of tropical fruit. Um, banana, a pineapple, papaya, a little bit of lychee in there, um, some kiwi, and I'm also getting some white peach and some apricot, so very, very fruity. Um, and then I will tell you guys what it was double fermented with after tasting. So that was the white wine. Now let's go ahead and sniff the rosé. Again, the nose is very intense, like I just I put it there and I can smell it. It's very intense. Um, this one smells very, very cottagey. It smells like peaches and strawberries and roses, um, kind of like peach cobbler. So there's a little bit of vanilla and a little bit of spice in there, which I kind of appreciate. Um, honestly, there's another, there's a YouTuber and she goes by Darlene Desi and she does a lot of really adorable uh, videos on living her life just 
very cottage core, at least that's what it feels like to me. This wine smells like what I imagine she would smell like, so <laughs> darling Desi, if you ever see this, maybe you should try this one. I think you would like it. So yes, um, peaches, strawberries, rose, and intense nose. That's the rosé. So now let's go ahead and sniff the red. Okay, so for the red, the nose is once again very intense. I was smelling raspberry, black currant, um, a little bit of cinnamon. I was also smelling some green pepper in there. So very fruit forward, very intense, but a bit more mellow than the other two in terms of that fruitiness. So that's the red. Now that we have given them all a sniff, it is time to give them a taste, and we are going to start with our white wine. Okay, so for the white wine, I could smell every, I could taste everything that I smelled before, so that makes things very easy. Um, on the palate, it felt very off dry, so there was a good bit of sweetness in there, but it was also very high acidity, which means it felt more refreshing. I didn't, I didn't feel very cloying, so that was very pleasant. In terms of the finish, it had a very long finish, which makes me very happy. That fruitiness lasted on my tongue for a while before that flavor petered out. So that was the white wine. Oh, and for the white wine, the alcohol felt high. Thought I should mention that. Now let's go ahead and try the rosé. Okay, so for the rosé, I, once again, Tasted everything that I smelled, makes it very easy, no surprises there. Um, it did feel off dry once again. However, the acidity was more medium, so it did feel sweeter than the first one, for sure. Um, that finish was very long, which I appreciated, and the alcohol felt medium. So I think it tasted pretty good. It, it tasted great. I liked it. So that's the rosé. Alrighty. And last but not least, we're going to go ahead and give the red a sip. So, let's go! Okay, so the red. Um, again, tasted everything I smelled. No surprises. Pretty cool. Um, I will say the... The mouth, it felt... Once again, it felt off dry. However, the acidity felt high and the tannins felt velvety. So... It didn't feel super sweet and super cloying, although I still get that did get that sweetness on the tongue, which I appreciated. The finish was long. I honestly, I'm starting to expect that out of a red wine, but I did appreciate that as well. And the alcohol felt very high. I definitely felt that warmth in the back of my throat and sort of uh, after a sip, I, it felt warm all throughout my mouth. So high alcohol, very pleasant. Alrighty, so I did mention that at the end I will be telling you guys what they were all double fermented with. So, for the white blend, this one was double fermented with, drum roll please, pineapple juice. So that really does kind of explain that very heavy tropical fruit quality I was getting and the nice acidity. So, pineapple juice, double ferment. I appreciated that. Now, for the rosé blend, it was double fermented with, a drum roll please, peach juice. That really explains the very cottagey sort of flavors I was feeling out of that one. So very, very tasty, um, although on the sweeter side. So if you're not into that, maybe don't try that one. And finally, for the red blend, it was double fermented with, drum roll please, raspberry juice. Um, yeah, I definitely, that makes sense. Definitely taste of the raspberry. So that was pretty good. This is craft wine, you guys, um, at least commercial craft wine. If you do a lot of home winemaking, perhaps this isn't all that strange to you. I definitely see a divide in home winemaking versus commercial winemaking, um, and there seems to be a very differing opinions on what's the right way to make wine, but, um, now we have an example that maybe there isn't a right way to make wine, there's just some good ways to make wine. Food for thought. Um, pairings. <laughs> this, uh, all of these wines would go very, very well with 
pretty much anything, any, you know, food you could think you'd want to eat. I think because they are on the sweeter side, you have a bit more wiggle room in terms of what you can pair them with. Um, the white wine, I just keep imagining myself drinking this with like cacio e pepe. Maybe I just like pasta, but that's that's what I picture. I can see this working very, very well with cacio e pepe. In terms of the rosé, I really want to pair this one with pot pie. Um, I like pot pie. Maybe that's just why, but it just, this feels kind of warm, kind of sweet, and pot pie just feels like a hug, so I'd put these two together. And I think I'm just in a pasta kind of bready mood, because for the red blend, I just really want to put it with gnocchi a bolognese. I just, I really love gnocchi, and I really love gnocchi bolognese, so I think this would work very well. Um, <clears throat> bolognese got a little bit of a, at least the ones that I've had, there's a little bit of sweetness in there from the tomato, um, and the other vegetables that kind of go in, it, it, it's, it tastes so good. I can see this working very well with that, so there you have it. So that was Lefty Wine. Um, Pretty cool stuff. Definitely makes me want to get a little bit more experimental with my own things. Um, getting more into the home winemaking scene, learning a bit more about that, and um, maybe if I find something truly worthwhile, I'll share it with you guys. Although, um, it does make me think of this question. What is the weirdest wine you guys have tried or heard of? Um, a lot of wines that I try feel normal to me, but the weirdest wine that I've heard of is pawpaw wine. And if you guys don't know what a pawpaw is, I don't really know how best to describe it, so I'm just gonna put a picture right here. That's a pawpaw. Anywho, so yes, what is the weirdest wine you've heard of or tried? Um, I lost my train of thought. It went somewhere and it, it left the station without me. Oh, yes. Um, if you have not done so already, be sure to subscribe. I release videos every other Friday, uh, twice a month. That means I don't bombard you. I know y'all are busy people. Y'all have places to be, things to do, and who has time to watch something every week? I know that a lot of people don't, so guess what? I don't bombard you with that. It's only twice a month. Um, you're welcome. So if you haven't done so, be sure to subscribe. We do some pretty cool things here, and you know, the more that we delve, the more that we learn, the cooler it's gonna get, so you're gonna wanna stick around. Uh, if you like what you saw, be sure to give me a thumbs up. I don't really know which one it looks like for, to your perspective. Like, I can't remember if it's this thumb or if it's this thumb. Although the direction, it really doesn't matter. You'll know. And, um, yeah, so I think that's it. I think so. that's all I had to say. Sometimes I, I have things in my brain and then they're gone, but that's okay. We'll just, we'll leave them there. Um, but yes, it has been a pleasure and I look forward to seeing you guys again in two weeks. Two weeks. That's two. I can count. <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to finish these wines and maybe uh, stick them in the fridge until later when I can have them with some cacio e pepe, pot pie, and gnocchi bolognese. That'd be pretty good. I'm kind of in the mood. Also, can I just say like how much I am vibing? with this like turn of the century steampunk looking like freaking 20,000 leagues under the sea looking art like that is that is cute <laughs>